All right, welcome everybody to the Optum Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Tuesday night edition. Tonight's topic, OCT and the management of glaucoma green isn't always clean. And our speaker is Dr. Andrew Drew Rickson. He received his optometry degree from PCO and completed a residency at West Tennessee Eye Center. He's an attending at the Memphis uh, VA Medical Center, a consulting faculty member at Southern College of Optometry. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate in glaucoma, a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and the executive committee of the glaucoma section of the American Academy of Optometry. He's a frequent author, lecturer, and peer reviewer. I've known Drew, Drew for a long time. He is a fantastic person. Uh, just a wonderful guy, a great educator, a great mind in glaucoma, and I'm really looking forward to see, uh, hearing what he has to say. So with that, Drew, please take it away. Good. Thanks, Joe. I'm also a tremendous contributor to the OEC blooper reel as far as getting things started. <laughs> um, now, really, really appreciate the opportunity to be with, with everybody tonight, and thanks uh, to Joe and Greg and Vanessa for having me on. Um, you know, the, the title is kind of a tongue in cheek title. It came from one of my coworkers was at a lecture and almost was a lecture that turned into an infomercial. And the entire audience was made to pretty much say green is clean. And it's like, you know, as, as optometrists and doctors, we're better than that. But I, I think what's unfortunate is a lot of times we, we get these hundred thousand dollar instruments. And obviously, the price point is lowered uh, nowadays, uh, but they come into the office the machine is there, it gets installed, there's some technician training and bang, you have it. And there's not that much um, information out there, CE out there and just some of the basics of OCT. So I think this is at an appropriate level. Some of it may be too basic for some, may be appropriate for others. And, uh, you know, we'll be interactive tonight. I'll promise to try to keep my energy up because I, I get after work, uh, you know, listening to CE, uh, it can be pretty brutal. So we'll we'll do what we can to keep you guys engaged. And if you have questions, just please jump in. I have no disclosures whatsoever on this. Um, I have tons of uh, opinions, but I will probably keep most of them to myself uh, as we go through this. Uh, I bet of the 119 of us in here, I bet there's probably five or six different OCT platforms that are represented. So I think what's really critical is learning concepts that are generalized concept that we can apply. And there's going to be some specifics to the individual platforms. At the VA, I have uh, OptiView and Spectralis. And over at SCO, I have Spectralis, OptiView, and Cirrus. So a lot of the cases are going to just be based on what I have, uh, but the concept should be universal, hopefully. So again, we want to go beyond just being the infomercial person that's you know working off colors. And I think this is a well-vetted piece of knowledge that we talk about here tonight. We're going to reinforce the role of the macula in glaucoma. And then we're going to really work on progression. I think progression can be really kind of mystifying sometimes. It's tough to tell, and it's hard to be patient, and it's hard to collect data, especially when you're just getting going in glaucoma. And I think, you know, ultimately, and Joe always talks about this with neuroophthalmology, we need more boots on the ground when it comes to glaucoma care by optometry. Uh, we see that the workforce projections for ophthalmology over the next 10 to 15 years are, are really, really decreasing. So we need to continue to, you know, get as much of that medical and get involved in it as much as possible here. So you'll see all kinds of definitions of glaucoma, but no modern definition of glaucoma is IOP in it. You know, but I think we all have these like things that are in our head that are beaten in there that we have these preconceived notions of certain numbers and we need to be better than that. So I think constantly coming back to what an actual definition of glaucoma is, what is it? Well, it's a retinal ganglion cell based disease. Right. And these changes ultimately, as we get to the bottom description here, are accompanied by a reduction in visual field sensitivity not just a field defect, it's that there's going to be ranges of loss and that's going to be mitigated by how much neural damage occurs to those retinal ganglion cells. You know, this is a, a good little, um, you know, schematic here. This is 
a schematic that was initially published in 2003 talking about the glaucoma continuum. And then Cold of Singh in 2009 put the different trials in there that we were all probably made to memorize, uh, not that they don't have value, but made to memorize for a test question for a glaucoma professor uh, because it's easy to get test questions off some of these things. And that it embeds certain thought. So these aren't always perfectly applicable, but when I started, we were probably over here, we were talking even swap, and now we're at a point where what used to be undetectable uh, is actually detectable. So it's definitely changed our paradigm and we're getting to glaucoma diagnosis earlier and earlier and earlier. And I always say, you know, when you're listening to a speaker, you have to figure out how that speaker is attempting to manipulate you because sometimes they'll use data uh, and not really give you any sort of context behind the data. So I'm going to try to manipulate you by saying, hey, OCT, it detects damage upwards of eight years before the visual field defect. Well, that's a lower percentage of the time, actually. It's closer to being about maybe two years off, um, but it can be upwards of eight years. And that just kind of is a selling point for how critical OCT has become in the diagnosis and management of glaucoma. Uh, Greg, when we were up in Nashville, did a good job talking about fear from a practitioner's standpoint. I like to talk about being uncomfortable and being uncomfortable is what makes you better. Uh, although you are uncomfortable in the process, so it's not necessarily fun. So I like to look back and see like, what was I doing in 2009? Okay. And I certainly hope that Rick's in 2024 is better than 2009 Rick's. So here's what Rick's in 2009 probably would have done. I would have looked at this and said, yeah, that looks pretty good. It's kind of in this double hump thing. We got the Tisnet. It's green. You know, same thing over here. All right, quality is uh, four out of 10. Yeah, that's fine. This patient's good. Literally probably what I would have done. So clearly I could improve and we want to continually improve. So there's going to be some you know cases that I put in here that in hindsight appear to be, you know, pretty poorly understood. And, and that's okay because we learn from our mistakes and some of them are my, are my, my mistakes and some of them are others, but they're mistakes I would have made. Okay. So this is one, again, it's a safe space and you're hiding, not hiding, but you're in the confines of your house or office. So do you admit or deny that sometimes it just feels better if you have a case that the OCT shows green on? And I do not judge. You're like plan of fitness. You're in a no judgment zone. I'm in a no judgment zone, at least, you know, for the, for the purposes of tonight's poll, I guess I should right. answer it myself. So Joe's already put the handout into the chat box. Thanks, Joe. If you guys want to download it, it was also in the email before and it'll be tonight. And I saw someone have a little issue with the polling question and, you know, try and figure it out, log on, log back off or, um, not my most likely work. I, I'm not seeing the polls either, but I know what's wrong. Okay. And here you go, Drew. Here's your first polling question. Can you see the results? That's good. That's good. And and now we got that off our chest. No one has to pay the copay at their therapist. This is amazing, right? Um that's right. I, I think this is I think this is just reality. You know, it's hard. We're so programmed from stoplights and all these other colors we interact with, it's hard not to be like, hey, it's green, I feel really awesome. Um, I was reading something the other day in psychology where they do thin slicing versus thick slicing and the thin slice is just bang, I make a quick judgment. It's hard not to get past that bias on these things. Let's see if I can close that. So that's in the middle of my screen. Okay, there, all right, thanks, Greg. Okay, so let's, let's go on here and start working and see. Uh, next. Okay, so we're going to go on to a green is clean case number one. So 68 year old white male comes in for just a routine examination. He's got a history of ocular hypertension. And there's been a mutual decision for watchful waiting, which can be completely reasonable. We work in a patient centric approach, right? So we advise the patient, the patient tells us what they want to do in the right approach. And that's not always the case. It depends on different generations. But this guy's, you know, been on medications, recently had had prostate cancer diagnosis, had gone through uh, cryo and just didn't want to mess with another diagnosis. So I think there's a reasonable thing as we go through here. Um, you know, anytime you're lecturing, you have to convince your audience of certain things, right? So there's some numbers in there 
that a lot of people will head for the hills when you see the 30. So I'm going to try to convince you that that is not necessarily a problematic thing. Uh, pachymetry, we're using ultra, we're using ultrasound back in the day. Now we're using optical. All the studies were done with ultrasound. There's a little bit of a difference. This was done with ultrasound. So above average, you know, kind of moves the needle a little bit away from glaucoma if you look at risk factors, but you got to apply it to the individual person. And then we look at optic nerves heads uh, from a CD standpoint. And, you know, CDs are theoretically unremarkable. There's a lot more context and the fields are unremarkable. So because this 30 is in there and a lot of people are going to react to that 30 without really looking at the qualitative aspects of that 30. And what I mean by that is, you know, what's the hysteresis? You know, we're not going to talk about hysteresis, but how does the eye dampen IOP? You know, what is it as a shock absorber? You know, how thick is the, the cornea? How does that affect the, uh, the IOP reading? So we're going to go ahead and use a risk calculator. And so this risk calculator is just a decision support tool. And we end up with this 4.8. So 4.8 was the same amount. It was 4.4 of the OAK study of patients that were actually treated. So this guy's risk, if we try to apply it, and I know I'm taking some liberties here because it's tough to do that for each individual patient, but it's it's not that high relative to you know being treated. So if he's about the same treated as he would be untreated, one could make an argument that you know it's reasonable to watch for weight on this guy. So 4.8. Let's go ahead and the threshold to treat. It's I, I really like this. This is out of Wilmer. It's available. It flips it over to something we know, which is IOP. No one's walking around saying, you know, my personal five-year risk to treat threshold is 17.2. No one's doing that. We're still looking at IOP. And what they found in this case is this guy on average would need to have a pressure of over 32 in order for us to even consider treating him. So it seems reasonable overall in spite of a couple of those high IOPs. And I'm not, this is not an oats talk, but just to talk about this briefly, the 20 year study showed essentially that patients were just as likely to die as they were to develop glaucoma overall. But the reality is that there are still some patients, as you see at the bottom here, that end up losing vision or need more intensive therapy. So you have to figure out what the individual person needs. But at this point, it's reasonable for us to do watchful waiting on. Them. And then I think in general, when we talk to patients about any disease, uh, and anything we're doing treatment wise, there's a difference between what their risk tolerance is and our risk tolerance is versus risk capacity. I think that's a really, really, really important concept. So this guy on the left that's hiding his money under the bed may actually be able to have the capacity to mine Bitcoin. OK, and you know, spend two thousand dollars a month trying to mine Bitcoin in his house, um, but he may just only want to hide his money under the under the mattress. So you may have a patient who doesn't have that much risk, but their risk tolerance is low. So it's a very individualized approach. But let's get back to the case and get away from some of these concepts. So the nerves, it's monoscopic photos. I think for all intents and purposes, these nerves are pretty unremarkable. I get that there's some CD asymmetry. There may be some difference with the actual disc size. And some of that stuff is not in there because that's not what we're going with. So if we go off Rickson 2009, what do we see here? It feels good, doesn't it? It's clean. It's green, right? So we're feeling pretty good about this case on a very, very thin slice. Obviously, you know from the purpose of the of the lecture that it's going to go sinister here. Uh, and that's, I don't even think, a major tease or preview here. All right. So from a field standpoint, gaze tracking is good down here. He's looking pretty good. Um you know, and Joe taught me this during the glaucoma diplomate process. He was my mentor. And he was like, Drew, you're you're going through and you're trying to come up with this is a nasal step and this is a germ and that's an arcuate. Does the defect resemble something that's glaucomous in nature? And I think you might could argue, argue that there's maybe something going on there. But the reality is we're going to argue that this isn't green, but yeah, you know, it's clean. So let's go back in time. We'll get on our DeLoreans and see what happened five years earlier. And you can see really nice, robust tissue going through both. And this was actually written in the chart. And again, we work on constant quality improvement. Like that was in a chart in a medical record, all quadrant screen. It's inane now, but at the time it seemed reasonable to write. So let's look at what's happening. Okay. And so with spectralis, there's this change analysis and the thinner it gets, the redder it becomes as that moniker to kind of spark for you that there's a change. 
all quads green. Then we go to the next um, year, or actually two years later, because we're in 2014. OCT RNFL, again, this was literally in our medical records. OCT RNFL showing questionable progression, OD. However, it still remains in the normal range. Okay, fair enough. Come back and we see it now and we say it's POAG mild stage. So were we missing something in this process? Well, let's look at this. Let's look closer and not even that much closer. And the machines all have more comprehensive software to make this easier. But for the purposes of demonstrating things, I'm just laying it out like this. The most repeatable parameter in OCT is RNFL and, and arguably uh, GCIPL. Uh, not isolated GCL and maybe GCC plus, but let's just talk about global RNFL. So we're going to concentrate on this, even though I have, you know, superior temporal and inferior temporal. So from 2010 to 2012, 114 to 110, that's noise, which we'll talk about a little bit later if we get to it. Then from 2012 to 2014, we're down to 99. And then 2015, we're down to nine. Okay. So we'll talk about what's substantial and what's not. All of these are within the green. Glaucoma is considered on average to be a nonlinear situation, right? So you're plugging along, doing pretty well, and then there's a drop. And you see this drops occurring here, and the slope is, is four microns per year on global. We'll get to what the relevance of that is throughout the course. And then if we look at the sectors, which are important, you know, I mean, where does glaucoma be affected or where does it affect? It affects the poles, right? So superior and inferior, specifically inferior temporal, superior temporal is where you have damage. So this is plugging along. And then my Tom Petty tribute is there's breakdown. And then this dude's just in a straight up free fall. Okay. So we look at that. That's, that's an insanely fast slope. Now, the left eye, for some reason, even though the parameter is based on what we've actually recorded thus far, seem to be the same, we're missing something. If I recall, this gentleman had a much lower hysteresis. So his ability for his eye, and specifically his optic nerve, to actually withstand the forces that that nerve was experiencing was not that great. But that's how it goes sometimes. So a quick thing here is like sometimes we get really, really lulled into that false sense of security because the tissue is so thick. We're like, oh, it's thick. It's green. This is amazing. I even use the term robust. I guess to sound fancy. Uh, and, and, you know, the rate of change of RNFL is actually a little bit faster the thicker you start with initially. And we don't know what the patient, I mean, I gave you the snapshot of what it looked like before. But you don't always know that the first time the patient comes in, you look at their nerve and you think there's something irregular. Or in this case, the IOP is something that sparks curiosity and you're doing risk assessment on. So what's available in SDOC, SDOCT? This is just to give you a historical perspective of the speed of these SDOCT uh, instruments back in 2014. That's what was available. A good article from Review of Optometry by uh, Mandy Pennington back in uh, 2022 has the breakdown for some of these newer ones. So Cirrus is up to the 6,000 now. Spectralis has third generation. iView exists. Um, Cirrus is now up to 100,000 A scans. That's not 100,000, obviously. Um, I cut that off. And the OptiView Solix is at swept source speed, but it's still SD OCT. Uh, so these are just a lot of different platforms that will be out there. So, you know, when we think of things with any of these instrumentations, they're just probabilities, right? And so from 95th percentile here down to 5th percentile there, it's 90% of the tissue, okay? So any of these instruments, when they capture RNFL, which is neural tissue, they're going to go ahead and have this dynamic range. And the dynamic range goes from the bottom, like the least amount of tissue you could possibly capture to the top they could capture. And then every time I do a scan, there's going to be noise. So noise from one scan to the next is essentially a step. And so what they're going to tell you is that we can measure multiple steps of noise within that green. And those steps could be significant. And the patient could just be tanking and losing a lot of nerve fiber layer tissue or ganglion cell tissue. Uh, and where we're just sitting idly by saying something like, hey, it's still on the green. So we got to be careful with that. Um, and then implications again, and this is specifically talking about glaucoma suspects from the Cirrus handbook here, is it just says, again, we can be missing change that's meaningful change while we're just sitting in the green.
the other thing is this is these databases. And I picked this up. I'll give I, I try to give credit to anybody that gives me information that then I then use. So Leo Sims talked for us for our glaucoma symposium for Academy a couple of years ago. And Leo was like, you know what, Drew? And then he went and he educated the audience on this. He said, I don't call these normative databases because they're not normative. They're based on a, a small number of patients. These are reference databases and each machine has their own reference. And so the FDA actually, believe it or not, doesn't have any standard or guidelines on how they come up with these databases. There's really not that much out there that says, okay, outside normal limits or borderline really has that much impact for my sensitivity or specificity. Just forget that stuff, but just diagnostic prowess. And then if you look at this, if there's not really any rules, I don't want to say it's wild, wild west, but there's not really any rules. Well, you know, how do I compare platforms when a patient comes into me from, uh, you know, comes in to see me from another VA or they come into the optometry school from another practice or vice versa. Someone comes from my practice to see you. It's hard. You can't compare. These are the reference databases, right? You look at this a huge difference between numbers. Avanti is 640. Uh, Sears is 284. Spectralis used to be 201 white German guys. Okay. It's like, how do I necessarily apply that? And then you see the various age makeups and the racial and ethnic mixes. And so you really don't want to use these all the time from a strictly diagnostic standpoint. And I, I think it's really important to always say that from a diagnostic standpoint, you should have a really good clue on the front end. And the really good clue comes from your skill set. And I would say the most important thing or individual in the exam room is the patient. But secondarily, and arguably the most important is actually you. So you're looking at that nerve stereoscopically, systematically, and you're the one that's making the decision on these things. And then you should have a clue of how things might behave on the OCT on the front end, rather than letting the machine guide you on the back end. And this is my opinion. I just think we can do that. Okay, so let's get to another polling question, because uh, we're going to talk about another potential thing. So commercially available OCT instruments, they account for axial length. True or false? I don't like hey, Drew, Drew. questions. Okay. Drew, yeah, I, I was gonna I was gonna share with you based upon what you're talking about, the normative database. If you go back several years and think about it, when we first got the the update on the Humphrey visual field analyzer, when they had the stat pack, the statistical yeah. package. Drew, are you aware of how many people were in that database? I don't know that, Joe. That's that's not I, a trivia item I, I have. It is a trivia item that I do have. There are 12 people. <laughs> That's amazing. I've got I've got a case. Yeah, we'll talk about that mm -hmm. on something else. Yeah, it's really interesting. And then it's presented as this be all end all. Um and, and that's 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 insane, actually. That's pretty impressive. I like that piece of trivia. I will uh, definitely recite that and maybe take it for myself and not give you credit, Joe. Of course I will. No worries. No, I appreciate that. That's that's great. Hey, Drew, you mentioned during you know your case, you know you talked cornea hysteresis. Yeah, um, and not maybe everyone is familiar with what instrument. And can you just take maybe a thirty second of yeah. you know the cornea hysteresis, um, what that is? So the thought process with corneal hysteresis is that you know traditionally, I don't want to get too much in Goldman, is that. When Goldman start, start out and we're doing pachymetry, there's a certain corneal thickness. But the corneal thickness is that invert thick law and all that stuff we learned in school. The reality is that law kind of disrespects the cornea. So the cornea has its own biomechanical properties and it has the ability to kind of resist deformation. And hysteresis is really like in Latin, I think it's or Greek, I think it's time delay. So essentially with hysteresis on the ocular response analyzer, they puff air in. And then depending on how long it takes for that applination and that deformation to return to the initial state where the cornea is, is the hysteresis. So I would say it's like a shock absorption, right? So if you're driving down a road like Memphis, we just had snow. We have no capability of handling that snow and our roads are trash. So we have a ton of potholes. So if you have a car that's rolling through that street and you have these huge potholes and your shocks are not good, your car is going to get damaged if your shocks are, or you're going to at least feel it. So the shock absorption, if you have new shocks, you'll have no issues whatsoever. 
uh, you won't feel it. So an eye that has an inability to resist uh, deformation by air, namely the cornea, is thought to have less ability to resist the pressure in it. So the cornea is thought to be a good moniker for what might actually be happening at the nerve. So lower hysteresis is more likely to have damage, more so than corneal pack imagery, which has traditionally been the metric. And a thicker, or not a thicker, but a higher hysteresis is more likely to not have glaucoma. So these are prognostic indicators. Hopefully that made sense. Yeah, so it's nothing more than just another measurement, IOP, cornea thickness, cornea hysteresis, and it's with the ocular response analyzer, which is by Reichert. Again, we're not promoting any equipment, no. but I think that's the only one that's out there that has the cornea hysteresis. Yeah. And there's something else called a Corvus ST that, that looks at something too. The main thing is when you look at IOP, you can't react to the number. You got to try to understand what that means. Um, and pachymetry and hysteresis will alter that. And then the CATS device is out now too. So, yep. okay. Right, so, there's your poll results. Yeah, great. So let's uh, let's work with that. That's great. Appreciate the responses. So let me get this closed. And let me get back on here. Okay, so although these databases include refractive errors, there are very high ranges. They do not take into consideration axial length. Okay, so I have a 24-year-old white female optometry student. Um, this was a few years back. Um, this student is a little bit more on the anxious side, right? So you want to make sure, and, and patients, again, going into risk tolerance and, and what patients what you say to a patient versus what the patient hears and what their biases are going up and what's their emotional state and whatnot. So this student's a little bit more on the anxious side. So she comes in and, you know, these are her metrics and she says, Hey, you know, you, you do some glaucoma, right? I said, yeah, you know, I've been known to look at an OCT or, or, or two in my day. Right. And she says, you know, I was told in the lab that I probably have glaucoma. Okay. Because when you look at these OCTs, you got yellow here. This one's flagging. There's an exclamation point. And then when I blow these, I mean, your, your RNFL deviation map is showing a bunch of red here. So that looks like, hey, that could be an RQ of pattern. And then we come over here, just like we're really feeling good sometimes about the green, the red freaks us out, right? It's just like, it's red. It's like danger, like run for the hills. Um, and that's just not reality. And this this was something that, unfortunately, this uh, young doctor, a budding doctor, got this information without you know having context um, and was misinformed and was freaking out. So so let's kind of break that down. So clearly, you look at this, and this doesn't look like the longest eye you've ever seen, but she has a twenty seven point five millimeter axial length, right? Some epic uh, conus here, but the nerves are pretty regular looking. Um, under no circumstances does this look like a glaucomatous nerve. And she's 24. And, you know, JOAG is out there. Um, and there's some genes out there for JOAG that are probably not something we're routinely doing right now. But this patient does not have, or the student does not have JOAG. So let's look at this. Um, Drew, Drew, just just for a quick second, just tell the audience go what back? JOAG is. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, JOAG would be a juvenile open angle glaucoma. Uh, and I think as we get more and more genetics, and, and I mean, Joe or Greg, please jump in on this. I think JOAG used to be considered to be just shockingly rare. Um, it would be, you know, like a three-year-old up to like a 35-year-old. And, and I'm pretty sure I might actually have a JOAG paper of yours, uh, Joe, in print somewhere. Um, so you may want to you know, jump in on that. But it's unlikely that this young lady has JOAG. Yeah, the, the, the clinical pearl I can share with everybody, having seen a, a significant number of children with actual glaucoma, is there is no normal tension juvenile open angle glaucoma. The pressure is always high, and it's not close. It's not 21 or 22. It's 30 or 40. And you know what? Let's go back here for a second. Yeah, I didn't give you the IOP. But I'll guarantee it wasn't 40 because they probably would have put her on Diamox, which, again, is inane. But it's again, it's reacting to something rather than trying to understand the reality of that something. Because uh, as Joe said, that would be an open angle situation. So you're 
probably not giving that person something to lower IOP orally. Um, so the reality is that when we look at this, this study broke down eyes into short eyes, medium eyes, and long eyes. And most of these OCT platforms, again, you can kind of doctor the spectralis. There's some ways you can put some parameters in before the scan to help influence that. But in busy practice, I'm not going to sit there and have one of our technicians uh, change the axial, uh, the curvature metrics that are on there. And most of these other OCTs, you, you're, you're not able to do that. Um, so they don't bake in axial length or axial magnification. So the axial length influences this. So you look at this all on the same instrument, just with longer eye. So you look at the average RNFL from a short eye to a long eye, 86. It may not really be 86, but that's what the machine's reading. And the 86 is way thinner. And if I'm in a reference database that doesn't actually include patients that have high axial length, well, guess what? It's going to seem like it's much closer to the red or the yellow, and it's a lower probability and a higher probability of there being something wrong. And it's hard not to react to that. So that's just another like pitfall. You got to be careful. And this is where she was at here. Small nerve, 84 microns. If I went down to 82 microns, it would be yellow. Any, any comments on that? So no. I think it's really important because I've done this and I, I think I've tried to get better on this. Um, I think we have a tendency here, at least, not, you know, again, I'm going to come clean on a lot of things here tonight. I guess this is going to be therapeutic for me. Um, the reality here is that I used to probably just order an OCT and, and the OCT is a platform, right? It, it's, a, it's a technology. You want to order very specific protocols on your OCTs. So if I'm trying to look at disc drusen, Okay, the distrusion consortium says I need to do a 96 slice dense with an enhanced depth imaging and a radial like 96 with enhanced depth imaging. Okay, so if I'm looking at glaucoma, I want to do, you know, on the spectralis, a three circle scan and a posterior pole. If I'm using Cirrus, I want to look at a disc cube and a macular cube. So I think it's important to change the mindset from just ordering OCT to specific things. Because as doctors, we're looking for specific things, and we have to go ahead and use those protocols to provide as much of an advantage as possible based on what we thought was happening on the front end. And the point of this is going to be that you see the distribution of the, uh, the heat or where the thickness is. It's along the vasculature, and that's where the Tisnet graph occurs. So see, those peaks are along the vessels. So let's talk about angular distribution. Okay. Because our, our, our young uh, patient had angular distribution. There's a term that's called nasalization that's out there. Well, that's a pathological term, okay? And it's when you have a lack of tissue that's supporting the central vessel trunk. And then essentially the roots are not you know held up and things kind of bow over. These vessels right here are temporalized vessels, Okay. This is a great article from Andy Carden and, and Chen here from a few years ago. It really does a great job on, on how to look at OCT. So the machine assumes, based on the reference database, that the distribution of the tissue is going to be here, right? But in actuality, it's temporalized. So it's going this way. I think I have a blow up of this. So what do you see right here? And again, we're looking at cool colors. We see these cool colors and you look at the deviation map it's hard not to look at that and react. Say the pressure was 24 and, and we felt like baseline OCTs were necessary or say you're doing wellness scans uh, and you don't, these machines don't take that into consideration. It's going to be hard to get past that initial bias of something being wrong based on how these patterns are playing out. When in reality, it's just that this didn't behave like the reference database wanted it to be. And that's in a temporalized situation. And these myopes are more likely to have temporalized vasculature. And then you see on this Tisnet graph where you'd expect where the black is to be where the thickness is. In actuality, it's pushed over. Okay. I don't think these are more dangerous situations. I think nasalized is more dangerous. I think I have an example, but let's look at uh, our optometry student now, uh, excellent doctor. I think she finished her residency a few years ago. And so these are the vessels at the angles of the vessels, but again, deviation map bad. So you can see how someone could have interpreted this in a certain way and then scared this young lady. 
This is what the machine thinks it's doing, okay? So again, just be very careful on temporalized myopic nerves. It's gonna go ahead and flag in a lot of these cases versus the reference database. And again, it looks like it's stretched and that's where it's supposed to be, supposed to be as far as the machine dictating to us what's supposed to happen. We should be using the machine uh, complementary to our own knowledge. So let's get into things that can create issues with our assessment. Quality is always critical when we're making decisions. And again, this is you know a great paper from a, a while ago. And, and again, I find that a lot of things when I start researching for, for lectures, it's extremely humbling because a lot of these references are from over a decade ago. And this knowledge was out there, but it doesn't mean that I had that knowledge. It doesn't mean you have that knowledge. Even Joe and Greg might not have that knowledge. And so it's, it's a lot of this stuff has been there. We just have to get the information. It's hard to keep up in daily practice. And that's why I hope, you know, tonight is useful for you. There's a lot of barriers to quality and artifacts occur no matter what you do. We are very, 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 very uh, supportive yet demanding of our technicians and they do a fantastic job, but even them doing a fantastic job doesn't preclude there being errors that could actually affect the red green. So there's noise that occurs. One's patient dependent area. What's that eye look like? So what if I have a longer eye? The machine could potentially get confused. What if we go in the reverse direction? So this, you know, let's say that you have vitreo retinal traction and that vitreo retinal traction finally releases, but you're following this patient over time. It's going to look like the tissue has dropped off. And if you're at one of those areas that could be a glaucomatous area, then it may look like there's actually glaucomatous change when in essence, it's actually just that the vitreo retinal traction has actually released. And you can't see that on every single instrument. You know, you can't see the tomograms. And so it's another factor that might actually happen. Um, and then again, this is a nasalized situation. I always call this tissue donation where the temporal side just decides to be kind and donate tissue to the nasal side, right? And it happens. This happens more in hyperopes where the patients have congenital nasalized vasculature. And it means instead of the central vessel trunk sitting at like the center of the disc or slightly over to the nasal side, it's like all the way over into the nasal vertical third. And so then what happens is it pushes all in like you see right here. It's supposed to be here. It's pushing nasally. And everybody's looking here because temporal superior. It's like that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at temporal inferior. I'm not looking to see that the nasal superior is way, way thicker than on average. And so it's hard not to have that bias again where something is wrong when in actuality, the patient's just a hypro. And again, these are probably more circumstances where you've worked them up kind of like an ocular hypertension case or when you're doing a wellness scan or something like that. And each instrument's gonna be a little different about whether you have sectors or clock hours or quadrants that you're working with. So a quadrant uh, measuring machines going to be less sensitive to this, but, but nasalized tissue is tough. I mean, it's really a tough thing. Um, if, anything, any questions? Joe? No, you're good. No. Okay, cool. So I'm looking at you guys and looking at, at your movement here. Um, so when we look also at, you know, if there's comorbidities and we can go into a thousand different things like ERMs and BRAOs and, you know, of BRVOs and, and, you know, drill and all kinds of diabetic changes, vascular changes, uh, AMD situations going on here. You got an, you know, atrophic AMD right here. You see, uh, you know, hypertransmission going on right there. So you got a, you got a C-Rora right there for the new terminology signal strength. So on the Cirrus handbook, they only require six out of 10, but I want you always to look at not only the uh, quality, but the reflectivity and the brightness. Look how diminished that brightness is as it goes downhill from a 10 out of 10 to a 6 out of 10. And look at the impact you could have. 10 out of 10, 100. 85 at 6 out of 10. If that's happening and now they're red, what do you think you're going to start flagging in your head? Because we're biased based on these colors. 
And then dry eye, it's optical coherence tomography. I mean, like what's the most important refractive body in the eye? You know, cornea, but really tear film, right? So if the tear film is not good quality, it's going to be hard for you to get consistent information if we really are making decisions based on microns. Let's talk about optic nerve head averages. So the machines don't, you really bake that in for, or at least the reference databases don't bake that in. The largest third of discs in this classification was 1.88. Now, if you go on to a certain scan, that's only a circle scan, and in this case is only a 3.45, and you have a 2.5, 2.85 millimeter disc, which everyone would agree is a large disc, this nerve is closer to the edges of this calculation circle that's measuring. So what's going to happen is the neuroretinal rim is thicker than RNFL over here. So it may give you a false thickness. Now, if I have a smaller nerve in that same calculation circle, it may actually depict this as being much thinner, even potentially red, even though the nerve could be potentially really healthy, but it's just farther from the edges of the scan. And I'll give you an example of that right here. So look right here. We have a standard nerve. I don't know what this is, but let's say it's a 2.0 nerve. The average nerve in spectral is like a 1.85, and that's area. So if we go here from the global 99, and all I'm doing is taking each uh, scan farther away from where the thickest point is. So if I go up to a 4.1, it drops to 88. If I go to a uh, 4.7, it drops to 80. So if I had a smaller nerve in a standard calculation circle, that might actually show false thinning. Um, now, just because you have a large nerve and it's closer to the edges doesn't mean that nerve is healthy. So you look at this, that nerve and that tissue, and this is the segmentation scan. Some tomograms have that where you're actually looking at the tissue. That's really thick tissue for reference. Um, and you look at the tisnet, it's above average. Okay. doesn't mean the patient doesn't have glaucoma, but this person doesn't have glaucoma. But this is a typical case where it gets worked up because we're biased to look at CD rather than looking at the size of the nerve in the context of that nerve. The nerves that are most likely to get worked up incorrectly are big nerves with big cups. The nerves that get missed the most are smaller nerves with moderate size cups because they're small. Okay, so if I have a 0.3 and a 1.1 nerve, that might actually not be a healthy nerve, but we're biased on CDs. Conversely, if you have a big nerve, it can still be glaucoma, where this is uh, really, really has a lot of focal changes consistent with glaucoma. And then there's device-dependent errors. The machine is not perfect, right? So I'll give you an example later where the machine did not capture the tissue correctly and made it look like something had changed. Back in the day, and maybe some of the current platforms you might have in your practice, the ability to get repeatable scans because the machine was measuring the fovea and the disc exactly the same every time, wasn't always happening. So if there's a shift, you're getting something different and it looks like that dropped off from 88 to 79. So let's see this. So, you know, we've got, let's say, and, and again, I'm going to say that no residents or externs were harmed in the filming of this, um, this lecture here. So, so we look at this, let's say the extern or the resident comes in and they're, they're making the right initial decisions. Hey, Rickson, like this thing's changed by 17 microns in 10 months. That's abnormal, y'all. Like that is really, really abnormal. So has this nerve progressed or has the tissue progressed? Do we need to go ahead and intervene if they don't have glaucoma and we're now diagnosing them? Or do we need to escalate therapy? Because it doesn't take much sometimes to trigger us. If we're already on the borderline, we have a certain risk tolerance. It doesn't take much. So we really need to vet these things. So that was quick. But, but really what happened here, I'm going to blow this up. Well, what happened was the machine got confused. And this happens from time to time. The machine did not catalog the tissue thickness of the RNFL between ILM and IPL right here. And so before, it looks like this. After, when I resegment it, it looks like this. Okay, we could have, in a snapshot, added another drop for this guy, sent him for SLT, sent him for standalone MIGs, combo procedure. Who knows how bad the disease is already? Maybe could have been sent for a TRAB, all based on false information, okay? Just because we were going off numbers alone. So with resegment or segmentation 134, post-resegmentation, same day, 
And then you see in reality, that patient had not progressed, but we were very close. Like the, the student or resident was like, Hey, I want to add something. Um, and think of the burden on that patient to number one, treat them for glaucoma for the rest of their life or add another medication, you know, cause more cytotoxicity to their surface. Maybe put them through a laser that they might be worried about the laser, no matter what you do to explain the realities of the safety of SLT or now the, you know, the Belkin specifically now. Uh, so you cannot assume that the machine is going to be perfectly repeatable every time. There's noise, there's operator error. So just because you order a scan doesn't mean that scan gets done well. So you have to always vet the quality as well. And that goes into training and expectations for your technicians. And so there's a difference between this scan and this scan. And I think I know which scan I would take. There could be misalignment either on the horizontal plane or the vertical plane. And then this one, I, I took this from Rex, Rex Ballinger at the, the Baltimore VA. We were looking at OCTs and Rex said, that's a roof artifact. I think that's how you pronounce it. If you're from Maryland and Baltimore, I apologize. Um, it's I call it a roof defect now, where essentially the machine is going to go ahead and have this range vertically it can capture. And so if the tissue or the nerve is at the top of that, it's going to cut off. And then the machine oftentimes smooths that over and it looks like there's a large gap where it's thinner. I'm going to move past this. We're going to move Actually, on. Actually, Drew, before you get too far ahead, a, a really good question came yeah. in. Okay. Talking about segmentation error, how often does it happen? I think it's how often you're looking. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is always kind of the issue, right? Anything I tell you is going to be based on personal bias and perception. I don't know that there's anything out there aside from that study I showed you earlier where I think the artifacts were like 20% and it didn't break down segmentation errors. I probably resegment a scan every day. Okay, so I don't know, maybe I'm looking at 15 spectralis scans for glaucoma day. So it's not a tremendous amount of the time. But I think because we realize that segmentation errors occur, if you have an instrument where you're able to resegment, the first thing you should be looking at always, in my opinion, is you go to that segmentation. So I always go, the first thing I look at in my remote, and I have a remote viewing software, so I can kind of you remote into the actual spectralis instrument. I'm looking at this tissue every single time. And I'm looking for segmentation errors because I'm trying to filter out on the front line anything that might influence my decision making. Um, so that's my personal observations. Uh, I see them every day and I, and I resegment every day. And you could absolutely say, you know, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So Rickson's sitting there looking at these. Like he thinks he's a radiologist and he's going through and looking and being ticky. Uh, but I see enough cases where it does actually impact my decision and the bias on the front end. Cause we have students from, from six different schools and residents from all over. Uh, they want like, it's, it's definitely something that influences their decision. And then when you resegment, it's like, Oh wait, this completely changed my thought process on this case. And again, when we're looking at these things, you're making umbrella decisions based on OCT and fields and, you know, life expectancy and burden and risk tolerance and all these different things. But it's hard not to get down at their root when you're looking at a root, not to be influenced and you have to step back. Uh, so I, I think it's an impactful thing. So I don't and know, you know Drew, I'm, got, Drew, I'm going to agree with you, Drew, that there are a lot of um, segmentation errors or at least changes because you got one up that you're showing right now you're showing vitreo or you know some yeah, vitreous yeah. traction absolutely um, you know the vitreous is alive out there the vitreous tugs on their retina you got vitreo macular adhesion you got vitreo macular traction you got optic nerve head it's the tightest spot around the vitreous is living and then even if it pulls off it creates uh, a crack in the retina sometimes and an epiretinal membrane and then it's segmenting off the epiretinal membrane and not the you know, not the uh, in, uh, internal limiting membrane. So I'm gonna just going to say in a short way, segmentation errors occur. Yeah, no, no, beautifully stated that the vitreous is alive. It is. I, I'm going to steal that as well. Um, because we do see that as well, just like you said, where you'll see the release and you'll see the diminishment. And let's say you didn't see that release occur like i may be able to track on trends and i can put up a couple of scans going up against each other and i can see that release of vitreous 
and the drop off, if I don't have that perspective, it's the same thing as if we have like a wedge defect and the patient's diabetic, you may not see that cotton wool spot or that infarct occur. And then we're biased for the, the, the wedge, right? So just, I guess I'm just going to go off as an aside here is when you have a diabetic wedge, a diabetic wedge is much thinner than a glaucoma wedge. But when we're biased to think that that wedge is going back to the nerve and that equals glaucoma, even there's no lamina damage next to it, um, we're going to think that that patient's got glaucoma. It's like, no, that was clearly an infarct, but I can't go back in time and see the moment that that occurred. And we do all have cases where we see the cotton wool spot, we do a scan, and we track that loss of nerve fiber layer. Uh, so no, it's a great point. There's a lot of things we just miss. Um, and we have to kind of consider based off patterns. And I think honestly, these patterns come up enough that we get used to them, that it's not something that in busy practice, you're spending you know, five hours and, and you're going in the, uh, in the black because all you're doing, um, or you're going in the red just because, you know, all you're doing is, is wasting your time looking at these things. So yeah, great question. Yeah. Drew, one, I think one of the challenges when you talk about resegmenting is now you're potentially introducing bias and error into it. I would probably, you know, I as I like to recommend, you know, not one thing will necessarily change and one difference does not progression make. But you have to look at it. What does the optic nerve look like? What is it happening in the visual field? What is happening with the pressure? You know, progression rarely comes unannounced. Usually you can predict the eyes that should be getting worse, and you're usually right. But if a person has a stable field and stable optic nerves and you get a change, that's when you should look at the segmentation. I don't know that I would resegment because I don't want to introduce error, but I'd probably repeat and see if it is. And I can have a justification for uh, not making a therapeutic change based upon a change in the OCT, but you have to explain your thought process. Yeah. And I think that's going to be each individual doctor is going to have to make their decision how you do it. So like I might go bottom up, you might go top down in your decision, but neither of us are going to sit there and have something that niche influence us that much. And I think a lot of times when we first start looking at some of these instruments, it's kind of fun to play with them. Um, but you have to understand that you do introduce bias. So when I resegment, I try to be extremely careful. There's a way that you can smooth it with a circle. And there's a way you can actually use these nodes to make it really, really, really precise. Um, and, you know, I've got it set up where I can do that pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, every set up subs can be different. So you got to get repeat in all of these. Um, yeah, moving on to the macula. Okay, so the macula is super important. And I think that it gets taken for granted. And then sometimes there's payer aspects of this. You know, for a while there in, in Tennessee, Cahaba, when that was our Medicare carrier, they wouldn't pay for the 92134 code. So a lot of people were like, I'm just not going to do the macula. But the macula is really, really, really important. If we go back to my initial definition, what was it? It was a retinal ganglion cell centric definition because that's where the neuron, the, the neural tissue comes from. That's where apoptosis is and that's what's happening, right? So it's important, important to look at it. It happens in all stages of glaucoma. I, I don't want to get into a huge field uh, talk here, but I, I just wanted to provide a little bit of perspective that when we do fields, we are sampling and we may not be sampling really, really well. So when we look at the central 10 degrees, if we do a 68.10-2, this is how we're sampling. So every time we do a visual field, and I say this to the patients, essentially what happens is you're looking at light, the back of the eye, the little nerves that make up the big nerve are going to sense that light or not sense that light. And if they sense that light, they're going to send that information to the brain, and the brain's going to tell your hand to push the button. Right. And so when we sample each of those individual areas, we sample 68 loci with a 10 2. And with a 24 2, we're sampling 12 loci. So a lot of times, if you use an OCT guided decision making process on what field to do, I think, you know, this can be beneficial to you. But I just wanted to provide a quick, you know, what's actually the concentration? The concentration is in that central 10 2. Um, and I think what happens is we are not doing the OCT 
or we're just doing the OCT like I was talking about before, where we just do an RNFL, you can see by this that the RNFL alone, or even these clock hours that are important clock hours, inferior temporal, um, and you know, the temporal side, uh, and there's some stuff out on an inferior temporal, uh, that's not going to do a good enough job from a diagnostic standpoint. You need more. So uh, let's pull the audience here. I, I routinely acquire macular scans and integrate them with optic nerve head and RNFL scans. Andrew, hey, I think Drew. You're, you're, you're caught up on, on the question, so you're doing well there. Right. Drew, at the very very end, uh, if we have time, I'll... I pulled some slides from some of my lectures to show some segmentations. I won't go right. deep into the cases, but I'll just kind of show a couple. Uh, at the there's beginning. a lot of error. There's a lot of error, Greg. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, but I just go back to what Joe said. I mean, you have to be making, you have to look at it from ten thousand feet sometimes in making a total decision. And when you look at the route, it's it's just that can be problematic. It's hard to take yourself off that ledge because you have a patient that you're concerned about and you do not want them to lose vision. So I think most of us are always going to err on the side of being towards over management rather than under management because we care. Um, and it's not bad to care, but I think we need to make sure we're not burdening the patient because we care. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We put a lot of, uh, a lot of trust in the OCT, I think is what we have to do. And I think, we do need to keep trust, but I think what we're trying to do tonight is just open up some skepticism. If it doesn't yeah. seem yeah. right, take a deeper dive. There's a reason why they put those B scans and different images that are on there. So you can just take a quick look. And then if it doesn't look right, get it open and take a deeper dive of it. So uh, oh. it's out there. So let me share the results here. Here you go. My yeah, friend. they're, they're right. not they're right. not Silicon Valley Rumpelstiltskins where you put in strong, get out gold. Yeah. Good that's a good that's good you know that's that's good i had a uh i had a buddy and actually uh or i have a, i have a friend that uh lectured so chris borgman lectured uh up in nashville great young doc uh model faculty young faculty member just fantastic guy very curious great lecturer and uh chris was doing a remote lecture two years ago and it was 10 percent. so this is this is good uh, so there's there's been a, a shift that I think is occurring, and, and that's a really important thing. So most of you, I may be preaching to the choir, uh, but for those that aren't doing it right now, I get that there are some barriers maybe from a payer standpoint, uh, but I would encourage you to consider it at least. So when we look at tissue, uh, you know, horizontal rafe there, these RQ bundles are going in this behavior, right? And so the only way to see that is coming from, you know, doing both scans. So the studies have shown even early on, uh, the group that actually created the Cirrus normative database, I think the uh, principals were at, at UNC uh, Chapel Hill, uh, they found that the best single GC, IPL, RNFL, or optic nerve head parameters were definitely worse than the combination. It's again, you're working harder rather than smarter in this case. What I always try to do is when I look at these is I try to figure out how is the tissue behaving, right? So if you split, if you split this in half, a horizontal rafe right there, and you know that the axons of the ganglion cells are here and they behave in arcuate patterns, I want you just to envision that that's what's happening. So superior temporal, I'm diving over into about 12 o'clock. Superior, I'm diving over to between 10 and 11 o'clock. And you think I'm crazy and I don't know how to know uh, what the hands on a clock are. Um, with Cirrus on the left eye, they try to normalize. So this is actually 11 o'clock to 7 o'clock on a Cirrus. Um, they try to keep the temporal tissue 7 to 11. All right. So in reality, I know that's 1 o'clock. And then if you go over here, your papillomacular bundle right there. So if you picture what's happening and how the disease, the disease actually behaves, I think it can be really helpful. Don Hood's pioneered this. So this is, you can access this uh, through his website. I think you may have to create a login. He does tremendous lectures. Um, and it reminds me of being from the Northeast with his New York accent. Uh, and he's really pioneered using OCT in the diagnosis of glaucoma. He's got this seminal paper on glaucoma's damage of the macula, which is a great read. And there's these four questions for every clinician diagnosing and monitoring glaucoma. 
And in those four questions, the questions often are asked, when should I do a macular scan? And when should I look at the actual raw data, like we were talking about with the segmentation scan? And their recommendation is on every case, okay? What's made it a lot easier for us is that the companies, some of them, most of them listen, right? And even if they're slow to adapt and help us, ultimately we get information that helps integrate knowledge. So we're not having this piecemeal approach, which can be really confusing. So these one page reports like the hood report that I have on my spectralis. Okay. So what we have here is we have this thickness deviation there. That's arcuate. Um, you could argue that that would be similar to an RNFL defect thickness wise on like a diabetic change. Okay. But this was a glaucoma case. You've got this arcuate pattern over here, which we'll get into. You've got thinning that's occurring right over there. You have a little depression there. So it all adds up. When we look at Cirrus, uh, they have the pano map, which combines the optic nerve head uh, or disc cube with the macular cube. And you put it all together. I used to make my students, I, you know, just be like, just repeat pano map. It feels good, right? Like you put that all together and you understand what's happening with all the tissue that can be impacted by glaucoma. I think that's really important because it changes your perspective away from like piecemeal confusion to understanding comprehensively. And then you look at Solix right now. Solix has the combination where it actually has your circumpapillary OCTA data. And you can look at your whole image and circumpapillary vessel density data to integrate that as well. And, you know, the OCTA data shows that the OCTA, circumpapillary RNFL, or sorry, the circumpapillary vessel density is a better, has a better relationship with perimetry than does standard OCT. So again, there's different instruments and different ways that we can look at it. But most of these companies all have something out there that we can integrate. So let's talk about a case. If we weren't able to integrate, we had it piecemeal and we didn't merge it. Well, you still are going to look at the tissue and it's important to look at superior temporal tissue and you see that that's all abnormal, but it doesn't tell you the whole picture. So let's talk a little bit about if we were doing it piecemeal and we're going to do a nerve scan one day, we do a uh, 92134 on another day uh, for, you know, if you're able to get reimbursed for it. And again, you guys are in practice, so you would be able to have more uh, statements on how to go ahead and successfully build for these things. Uh, from talking to people locally, it's just going to depend on carrier and it probably depends on state. Um, so it, it may just depend. But what I want you to look for is, again, the behavior. So this is called the temporal RAFE sign. Again, the RAFE, temporal over here. Uh, Tony Litwack, uh, who just is a godfather in glaucoma, was lecturing for us. And he said, this is a squeegee. So I still use squeegee uh, in tribute to Tony Litwack. OK, um, but the temporal RAFE sign is the correct term. So you have this delineation there of the RAFE where it's thin. And then you envision that you have an arcuate. My coworker, Jim uh, Williamson, who's really, really good at retina. He calls this the Costa symbol because he loves his Costa sunglasses. The other term is the Nautilus term. All of these are looking at patterns that are consistent with glaucoma. So if you don't have a panel map, you can try to piecemeal it together, but you shouldn't have to. So what has been pioneered most recently in the last four or five years by Don Hood is that the topographical structural analysis is the way. OK, and I truly believe this. And, you know, I think what's been interesting, too, is, you know, working with Joe during the diplomate process, um, we have you know, overlap with our generation, but you were trained in a more field era, right? Where I'm, I'm more OCT era. And, you know, I think we both had to adapt a lot over time. And so just going off OCT alone still takes us away to a certain extent from having that 10,000 foot view, but it can have a lot of value in our overall diagnostic process, especially after we've already looked clinically and we think we know what we have. So I don't know if you have any comments on that, uh, but I think, you know, your perspectives were really valuable, uh, obviously, throughout the entire training program, because it just makes you think differently. Um, so, I mean, how have you adapted your thought process now that we have these OCTs and we have these one page reports? I guess I'm going to put you on the spot because I think perspective is really important. I think that the OCT as well, you know, when you look at the macula, 
We look at the nerve fiber layer. We still have to look at the optic nerve. It's a very important component. We have to look at the functionality. Uh, we don't notice or we don't care about, uh, I mean, we care about a five or 10 micron drop, but the patient doesn't care about that if it doesn't affect their functional vision. So yeah. it's it's really a a combination of of everything. I think that we need to avail ourselves if you, if you have the technology to do this at the appropriate and repeat it at the appropriate times so that we can look for change over time then correlate that to what are the risk factors what is the risk of visual disability and the risk of visual disability really comes from the from the visual field so one is not more important than the other i think they're very very complementary to one another I mean, completely agree. I, I think I, I'm concerned sometimes, even though I'm doing an OCT talk on glaucoma, I'm concerned sometimes that we are making decisions on such niche information. And, and this is not niche what I'm about to present. Uh, but like when we're talking about a couple of microns, and I'll get into some, per, some perspective on that, that we're pushing hey, so, hey, so, sorry, go ahead. Uh, let me let me make a comment. I want to feed off of something that you just said there. Um, and one of the things that I've been saying a lot in the lectures is that, you know, we have to kind of think of are these acute problems, a corneal abrasion, a sty, um, a conjunctivitis, you know, acute, what is, what's the definition? I don't know, something that's four, four to six weeks or less. These are chronic conditions. And what we try to do is we try to make things in these chronic complex conditions, mm -hmm. binary or linear. And these things are not, uh, you know, they're chronic conditions. We just talked about the vitreous is alive. The IOP is going up and down. We got cornea hysteresis. We got all these biomarkers. And then I think what happens with OCT, because it is a, a you know, a comfort, it's our, it's our binky, it's our nice comfort blanket. Um, we really rely on it, but we have to remember that this is a complex, integrated, other diseases could be happening. Try not to make, you know, not you saying and Joe speaking, but we as a profession, try not to make it as linear or binary. Yeah, that's, that's a great thing. It, it's, it, it's a really dynamic process too. And I think, you know, the linearity, the binary, you know I'm saying, I, I just think, again, we have to consider so many factors I think we have to have a, you know, we've talked about this before. We have to have an overarching holistic perspective on these things about what we're doing uh, to our patients to a certain extent. And, and, you know, most patients are not fast progressors and a lot of POAG cases do not move super fast. So really, and I may get to this, our goal is determining who's a fast progressor and who's actually at risk for glaucoma. And, I've shifted how I talk to my patients that I do not think will ever go blind from glaucoma, where I will tell them, hey, here's the reality is looking at all the data right now, I don't think you're ever going to actually know you have glaucoma, but I'm still going to irritate you by bringing you in and making you use the drop or going for SLT and we're going to be vigilant, but I'm trying to at least change my reality of how I actually present information to the patients. Now, someone that you know is really highly likely to lose vision, I'm going to take a different approach. Um, but a lot of these OCTs, when we get down into these niche things, the change in the noise is like a death by a thousand cuts thing. And we don't have these smoking gun situations. I think that can get really frustrating. So when we talk about you know rationale and development of, of the topographical thing, this is looking mm -hmm. at everything uh, topographically. And I think it's really important from a diagnostic standpoint. And as y'all said, it should be a complementary piece because we've already looked. So there's questions to ask in this hood report that would be found on, on TopCon. I think this is a modification. Um, it's going to look through everything. And they do this <laughs> instant where they marginalize the nasal tissue because it's not that I don't care about the nasal tissue, but it's the least likely part of the nerve that I'm going to be concerned with. So they re kind of brand this or re, re um, moniker it. So the nasal isn't what you see. You concentrate on the tissue that's glaucomous in nature. So you have these deviation maps that are really helpful. Um, and you can see that right there with the thickness map. Well, I don't have that on my spectrals. I have a hood report that only looks at RNFL thickness 
and color changes. So we're going to see the questions that Don Hood says you should ask, which I think are really good perspective. Uh, so you have to ask yourself, and I'll go to the next uh, slide here in a second. Do you have, again, because glaucoma is an arcuate uh, disease, uh, is there an arcuate-like abnormal region on the RNFL probability, but I'm going to say thickness map for what we're trying to do here, associated with the temporal half of the disc? Makes sense. Temporal is important. Is there a topographically corresponding abnormal region on the GCL or GCIPL or GCC plus map that's going temporal to fixation and then coming in and corroborating with the defects you had on the temporal side of the disc? And do you have confirmatory uh, B scan of the damage? So let's answer these questions with my uh, spectrolis here. Okay. So we're going to look, we're going to dissect this nerve in half. And do we have this depression that you can envision being arcuate here coming off the disc? And again, we've already looked at this nerve and said, yeah, I don't like the inferior temporal rim. I don't like the lamina. There's some laminar holes there, or maybe there's some acquired pits there. Maybe there's a disc heme. We already have looked and we think there's suspicion. So we see that we've answered the first question in a positive way. So we have this arcuate defect. Now, if I take this uh, other question two, where I take, I dissect the macula in half or the fovea in half, and I look temporal to that, I'm going to have this arcuate bundle that's going ahead and it's corroborating the nerve defect that's coming there. And we know the defect is actually the damage is coming in the arcuate from actually the temporal oh. over to the disc, not temporal to the disc uh, going back. All right. And then number three, do we have the defect? And you definitely have the defect right here. And, you know, if you have access to something where you can look at the tissue, you're going to get used to looking at glaucoma defects. And this is kind of a broader defect overall. Uh, and that's instant. And then again, we look at the, the plot right there. So that all adds up. Uh, and I think that's just the way to go is just putting all the component pieces together, obviously considering the whole person and considering the visual fields uh, and the burden of treatment uh, and, and all those other things going on. So we're going to do a case that the error was made in omission and it was one of perspective rather than just not knowing what was going on here. So a patient comes in a long time ago, 65 year old African-American male, they've said borderline and it's, it's tough, right? Like, so if we took all of us on this talk, um, and we asked us all to somehow do a paragraph on what borderline means to us, I'll guarantee it would be all over the map, right? So when we put in a multi-doctor practice borderline, what does that even mean? Is it something that was came from an OCT or was a finding on a visual field? So I think that's a tough thing just to think about what we're putting in our charts uh, and maybe even drop downs that we might have in our EHR. So IOP 20, like in the patient has large discs. So if I have large discs, a 0 0.55, 0 0.6, those aren't big cups. But just because you don't have big cups for a disc doesn't mean the nerve isn't damaged. And these nerves, when I look at them, uh, this guy, this isn't like I can see your chiasm sort of a thing, like it's not that bad, but it's one of those ones where the nerves, they were glaucoma. So, I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts on it. So I was doing a talk. I've updated this talk a lot for, for tonight, and I appreciate the opportunity to update it. Um, but I was given a talk on uh, one of the instruments and I was in the middle of the talk and I saw this exclamation point I was going to talk about. I said, wow, this is yet another example of the engineers putting something in there that says, yo, dumb doctor, pay attention. It's an exclamation point. So this means something. So although we want to be careful not being overly influenced by the colors, what that exclamation point means on the Cirrus is that if you took this machine and you did an exam on it, and then you did another exam, the noise, the lower range of the noise would be closer to the next color that might change your perspective. So let's get into this case. So we've talked about before the deviation map is consistent with someone that has glaucoma. We already know it's glaucoma. You have thinning right there on the thickness map. You can see that the rim is thinner there, thinner there. It's an oval nerve though. So maybe you have an oval cup with an oval nerve. You have some red there. You have thinning right there. There's multiple things that show you something is off. But what do we have in the chart? We have some inferior thinning noted OS and some asymmetry between the eyes. However, chains are subtle and not too concerning at this point. 
Well, in retrospect, that's about as subtle as getting hit with a hammer. But the reality is that we know when we're first learning the language of these instruments, things appear subtle that ultimately, when we understand the language, are not subtle at all. And so then what was in the chart was say, let's bring this patient back for a four month visual field need to assess where the patient has undergone any significant change. So the one thing I always say is like, yes, from a field standpoint, we need a lot of data points in order to compare the patient to the patient to determine if they're progressing once we've made the diagnosis. If you think something is at all odd on one instrument, you don't have to feel like you're a glaucoma bot where it's like, it's time for my OCT. It's time for my field. I can only do this in these intervals. If you think something's wrong, you have to repeat it. Now you have to consider how many times can I repeat it and get paid? Am I doing AVNs or advanced beneficiary notice for my patients? Um, you know, but if you think something's wrong, repeat that instrument. And if you want to get other data points for meaningful uh, technology, namely functional tests, do it, but don't just move to something else because it's going to be really hard on the first or second field to assess change. How would you do that? So again, there's just some, some things that I think we say a lot and we do, but they don't really make sense. So let's look at the normative data details here, because when you click on that exclamation point, you get perspective. So the average thickness is in the green. Okay. So if you have kids, I have kids. I, I don't push my kids to be president, but I don't ever say, you know, my son's name is Liam. I don't say, Liam, hey, I really hope when you grow up or in school, you're going to be a ninth percentile sort of a guy, right? Like that's not necessarily good. And although the reference databases, I've already told you to be very careful with them, ninth percentile is probably not all that great overall. Now, if we were to do that scan on another day, it could be down to 74 because noise is four. So it goes from 74 up to 82 and down to 74. If you have a situation where you get a really, really good quality scan, like it was done in the trials. And so if I was at 74, I'm fourth percentile. So this would change your perspective. Hopefully it wouldn't overly bias you. But if you were just willfully, not willfully, if you were just kind of rolling the wrong, feeling happy, like we talked about in the beginning, because we see green and we want to pat ourselves on the back, this might wake you up and shake you a little bit. Uh, to make you think. So that's what those are baked in there for. So 2015, we come in, the guy's still got glaucoma when I take a look at him uh, for the first time. And you see some very, you know, pretty obvious things now that show deviations and thickness changes that are consistent with glaucoma. We already know by looking at the patient, they have glaucoma. And you see again, more green. Okay. And you know, there's change based on the quality of the instrumentation. I mean, these machines can't be perfectly reproduced. You look at the fields here. Um, and you know, again, this is an interesting one for fields. And again, I don't want to belabor points on fields, but gaze tracking is good. Uh, arguably, false positives are acceptable. I had someone that I was listening to, and they're like, my cut point is I won't accept a false positive greater than 7%. I'm like, where do you get that from? Um, so it's interesting with some of these things. But it's weird because you have this general reduction in sensitivity when in actuality, this is a reasonably quality field, you know, gaze tracking and false positives are what's used. They've taken fixation losses, Michael Patel and them in the 2012 uh, effective perimetry, they stopped using fixation losses. And the guy that was behind it kind of admitted it really wasn't that good. It was based on how your perimetrists actually behaved. So be careful with that. I think sometimes there's an over smoothing with the pattern deviation, but there may actually be something here. You know, there may be a defect there. You may have a little in, you know, inferior arcuate. But you look at this now, and the big piece of information I had that the other doctor didn't get, and I absolutely wouldn't have gotten a two years prior either, um, was the GCIPL, okay? And you look at this, and we talk about the temporal rafe sign, temporal rafe sign, arcuate, 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 arcuate. You got a double arcuate there. And we look at our normative data details, although I've told you to be careful, this provides perspective. My wife's Canadian, so I'm going to make fun of her a little bit. And she actually doesn't say, hey, if you say, hey, I don't judge you, but it might have been a deal breaker in our marriage. Uh, so we look at this and it's green, right? Well, but this guy obviously has a glaucomatous defect that you already know was there. So we have to be very, very careful 
with what we're looking at. So there's this macular vulnerability zone that has been out there and has been widely popularized. And that macular vulnerability zone says essentially that the inferior tissue is more likely to be damaged. And this was based on, it's similar, Joe, to what you were saying with STAPAC. I think the number of cases that they had visual fields on, that 10-2s showed defects where the 24-2s didn't show defects, and those defects on 10-2 that weren't seen on 24-2 mostly showed superior arcuates. Mm -hmm. And so then the most likely vulnerability zone would be this inferior tissue. I think it was based on like 15 patients or something like mm -hmm. that. And then we're all running around, might've been 12. And so it's like another thing that gets popularized and we lecture on, but the lecturer doesn't give you context. And I mean, I've probably hidden some things from everybody tonight uh, in order to make some points. And I think I'd probably dramatize some things, but I try to be very honest with you as we're going through this. Uh, so you gotta be careful with, with what you hear if there's no context. And so the panel map in the left eye, you know, not so, not so good. Um, and I think again, because we didn't put all the tissue together, we missed out. Okay, so I think I read too many like choose your own adventure books when I was a kid. So you are being forced to replace one of your eyes. Okay, and I think we need, I think I, I might have given you the poll questions out of order. So this is actually poll question, I think five, if you can throw that up. So you have to replace, and you have to lock in one of your eyes and replace that. So you're forced, you got to do this. I want you to thin slices, make a quick subconscious. You're forced to replace one of your eyes with either the right or the left from the next case, which I'll show you. So if we can hold on anyone answering until you see this next one, which eye do you choose to replace? Uh, is this poll question in the middle of my slide for everybody? We can still see the polling question. Okay. So if I move on, can you drop that for a second and put it back up? Because I do yeah. want to show, okay, if you can just knock that down, because let me go over to this. Okay, so really quick, look at this. Which eye would you replace with one of your eyes for the next 20 years? And I know what my eye is drawn to. I'm just telling you. So, yeah, Greg, if you don't mind throwing the polling question up now. So I want everybody to just make a quick snapshot decision and see what you got. Next 20 years is a long time, everybody. Some people did re respond. I just cleared it all out and okay, and that, relaunched it. So, thanks. Sorry about that. It was kind of how I set it up. I wanted to kind of set it up and then then show it and go from there. Just goes to show we don't rehearse. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, good lord, from the start when I couldn't even get my slides <laughs> up, I swear I, I swear I'm competent enough to do a PowerPoint and use Zoom. But I guess the uh, proof's in the pudding, right? <laughs> Yeah, so I guess I really can't. Yeah, it happens. All right, looks like a lot of people, well, no, the people are being slow to weigh in here. But I think the trend is here. I think we'll end up and share it. Huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm telling you what I do, and I jump over to the green every single time. Like when I look at this, let me go ahead and close that out here. Um, when I look at this every single time, unfortunately, I jump right to that. Okay. So I would rather have the right eye, right? And you know, it was 50-50. So, I mean, it's honestly an impossible choice that we you would never have to make. But again, I just want to go into some stuff here because I'm actually going to give you context and go more umbrella-wise. So when we go into the norm of data details, you're kind of screwed either way, honestly. If you look at just going off thickness and the colors, they're very close to each other when you consider noise. And then when you look at this, the right eye actually has the paracentral defect. Okay. Now that's arguably paracentral. I mean, you could maybe say it's coming off the blind spot. Uh, I think we always need to consider, you know, would the patient actually be symptomatic with being only down four? But if we're just looking at a pattern deviation, I'm probably going to choose to avoid that. So maybe not the best question. I just wanted to guess get an idea of how people would instantaneously react. Um, and that's interesting. A lot of times when I do this, um, and again, everybody's doctors here, you know what I'm saying? So you have the perspective. A lot of times when I do this with my students or residents, everybody's jumping towards that green. So that's good. That was, that was, uh, that was I was pleasantly surprised there. Okay. So I, I don't think I want to be walking around with a parasentral. And I mean, patients can have, 
uh, awareness early on when you actually talk to them about what they might actually experience. Another thing here is, again, to pound this home a little bit more, Scott Enzer, uh, one of my friends over at the optometry school, he said, Drew, this would be great for your lecture because everybody was concentrating on the left eye and they were all excited about how good the right eye is. So when we think of where the nerve would be on this GCL, think of the arcuate patterns. The arcuates are coming from superior temporal over to the nerve, from superior over to the nerve. And what probably used to be white is now green. And that's probably an arcuate defect right there in the right eye. And we were just looking at the left eye. There's no doubt that that left eye has a really a substantial loss, mild arcuate right there, substantial arcuate superiorly, but you got the temporal rafe sign over here as well. So you got to be careful not to get up into the white and feel like things are good either. You got to look at all the tissue overall there. Okay, so ODL together, we're going to put that, and we know that something is not okay. All right, so let's move on. Did anyone have any questions about any of that? Because I want to get into some uh, progression stuff. We got about 15 minutes or 14 minutes here. Any comments, Greg, Joe? No, no everything's good. You're caught up. Okay, sweet. All right, so how do we currently gauge success or failure? Are our historical behaviors correct? Is there a better way to guide us in our decision-making? Typically what happens and what I used to do in practice, and I'm a reformist at this point, the easiest exams for me when I had no clue how to do glaucoma was a target, was a pressure check. Patient would come in. I would have magically concocted a, a an IOP that was the magical IOP that this patient was going to be protected with forever based on three seconds worth of IOP that I had before. And they would come in and they would meet my target or not meet my target. And then I would decide right then and there, oh my gosh, you didn't meet my target because I'm a genius or I'm a wizard. And I'm going to add another medication. I'm going to send you for SLT. I'm going to send you out for surgery or something like that. So that's what happens a lot of time. At least I don't know if y'all do that. I used to do that. I absolutely don't do that anymore. I do glaucoma progression evaluations. Um, and so this is what happens in a case like this. This is what I would have used to do. This patient is not meeting target. I'd like to add another medication uh, by the resident, right? So let's see with this RNFL trend analysis. Each of these blocks is a year. So we have one, two, three, four, five, five and a half, five years worth of data. So we start treating this, this individual here, right? But this guy's not meeting target, you know? So, you know, we're so biased to the amazing ability we have to set targets and use targets based on randomized control trials that are studies of many and not the patient that's sitting in front of us and trying to understand what's tolerable for them or what works for them. This patient's not a target, so we have to freak out and add bromodidine for some reason. We add that. Bromodine, you know, I mean, there's hypersensitivity that reacts, uh, that can occur. You can get uveitis from bromodine. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that occur. It's not good for the surface. It's more back. And I guess, you know, you could get, um, if, if the patient's able to afford it, they could get, you know, Alfgan P with, you know, a different preservative. But let's say we're using generic bromodine just to add money, add, uh, save money. And what's that going to do to the surface? It's not going to, you know, your active surface is not going to thank you for doing that. Right. Meanwhile, what's happening with this person's glaucoma? Nothing. So the resident comes in. It's like, yeah, hey, they're not meeting target again. OK, so come on, let's do it. Let's max them out. Right. So max medical therapy is considered to be a PGA plus a fixed combo right now. But we're going beyond that. Right. Come on. We can do better than that. There's got to be a better way. And Greg mentioned biomarkers and, and OCT shows biomarker. And a biomarker is just tissue in one area of the body that either gives more information about that body part or about another system or body part okay so targets have long been used but until recently has never really even been shown that it actually makes a difference okay and on averages if i take you know, i forget how many people are in adages you know greg or joe you might know that but you take a lot of people and on average if they meet the target that's set yeah they're less likely to progress because yes, when you treat glaucoma and you lower pressure, everybody knows that actually helps. Okay, so it's not shocking, but in general, it leads to IOP obsession. Patient comes in, what's my pressure? What's my pressure? What's my pressure? I've shifted them over to asking me how their glaucoma is. There's a great editorial in Glaucoma Today a few years ago 
that was it was literally titled stop asking me or don't ask me about your number i don't care i want you to care about what your actual disease is doing and change the narrative they need to understand that as long as they're doing what they need to be doing with our guidance they're doing what they need to actually have success and we will go over what their disease looks like with function and structure every time and this iop obsession resulted in me overmanaging and undermanaging people in the past. Lucky for me, a lot of POAG patients aren't rapid progressors, and I probably got away with some stuff. I'm not going to lie to you. So we have to determine, looking at how the disease behaves, what is a tolerable IOP level, and you do that by treating the patient and seeing how they behave and they get better. Drew, uh, I want to echo not- what I want to direct yeah, what you said because twenty, you know, twenty some years of now treating glaucoma. I think you say I'm going to echo it. Um, you know, I set a target pressure. I kind of let my guard down, and ah, that's not progression because I'm at target. And then they actually were progressing because I was at target. Yeah, I think it, the way I look at target pressure now is it's a way for me when I initially assess the total picture of this person's glaucoma what their presumed life expectancy is, what their potential for burden is. It, it's a matter of like, how aggressive do I think I need to be? And that's it, right? And then I say, this is what I want. So if it's severe, it's like I'm scorched in the earth, right? And they're 50. If it's something else, I might be less aggressive, but I'm not beholden to that. And that's a great segue into this dynamic market IOP concept. And they use a stock market example. So it's like, you know, if I buy something for $250 a share and it drops to $140 a share three days later, it's like that wasn't a good buy. Okay. Like you look at like a Pellis stock or something like that. That's, you know, up and down depending on how the trials went. Um, and I, I'm not going to get any further into that. Now, if I buy that at 250, it goes up to 420. All of a sudden, I look like a genius. So the thing is, at a later stage in time, the target that might have seemed like a good idea when I initially set my aggression might be really, really bad because the patient's disease might not be moving at all. And I might be destroying their surface, bringing them back too much, giving them emotional burden. And so it's a constantly dynamic thing as you're going ahead and managing these patients. And a great way to do that is looking at the tissue. And again, if you are a fast, fast, fast progressor and they're 50 and you think they're going to live to 100 and you think it's already really, really bad for them, I don't care what you're thinking, you don't have time to employ this concept. You're just going to shoot first, ask questions later. And I could care less if the person's eyes are beat right on repression. I tell them that. I mean, I get away in the South was just saying, hey, I'm a Yankee. I'm going to be really direct with you. I say, listen, I don't really care because my job is to make sure we're preserving your vision in those cases. But in a lot of other t- cases, you have time to actually make decisions. And we're moving more in the literature to saying, hey, we should actually look at our tissue And we should look at our function in making determinations of our success rather than going off just target pressure alone. So we want to kind of consider using target rate of IOP or sorry, target rate of progression. Uh, So I think what I would have liked better to see on this patient is the resident come in and say, hey, this patient is not meeting the target that you set, Rickson. However, this is what you did, Rickson, not me. Their disease is unchanged over five and a half years. Patient has SBK. Let's say their OSDI is like 60. We're thinking about putting them on an autoimmune or immunomodulator that maybe if I'm in the private sector, depending on what they have, maybe I can't get that for that cheap, even with some of the company uh, assistance programs, right? So can I remove the bromonidine and adjust the target? Heck yeah, you can. And so in a case like this, you DC the bromonidine. This guy's doing fine and you reset the target up. We're not getting a lot of IOP. So that's how you use tissue thickness to know what's going on. And progression is paramount. We want to look for these fast progressors. It's crucial. I'm going to try to speed up a little bit here. It's a progressive disease. It's slowly progressive. Um, there's a lack of linearity. There's no consensus on how long a time it takes to know whether or not you've had success. Uh, the thought process these days is two OCT scans per year are likely sufficient to detect. Studies show on average in glaucoma, if you only do one OCT per year, taking into consideration noise, it's gonna take you five years to determine progression in a lot of cases. 
unless of course they're a fast progressor and then it's easier. So set a target, set a target rate of progression. Um, if you have to set a target rate of progression, or if you're looking for progression, you have to, you're, you're limited by the machine. So if the machine is day to day variable by 10 microns, this change of six microns is probably not actually attributable to pathological progression, or you don't actually know because there's too much noise. So that's within the noise. So you don't know whether it's significant change or not. And I don't know if I'm going to get to it, but five microns, depending on how big you think an axon is, is roughly equivalent to 140,000 axons. So you have to understand that if you lose five microns and that's within the machine noise, you have to accept that you're just going to drop off 140,000 axons. But the reality of that loss of that tissue is, as Joe and Greg said earlier, we're looking at this from this umbrella perspective that historically was based in this quote unquote undetectable range in fields. And we weren't necessarily doing a bad job with our care of our glaucoma patients. Now, if you have variants of three microns, which I think the Solix is down to a repeatability of about two and a half, uh, which is very impressive. Almost the other instruments are all about four or five microns. Uh, but if I have noise from day to day of three microns, that change of six microns all of a sudden starts getting more significant. I'm gonna move on past this. So again, noise on uh, most of the instruments, let me get in here is significant change four to five, uh, GCL two to three, and then five microns could be 141,000 axons. Age-related attrition is about 0.5 microns for years. This is from our review of optometry article, which I think was good. It allows you to not do the work that I did putting into it and still learn, which I think helps. And so these are fast rates of progression are about two to four microns per year. And again, four to five years. So let's, I just, cause I want to cover rule of five really quick. So I have heard of the rule of five. We're going to do this polling question real quick. And then I'll probably end on rule of five. Cause I don't think I'm going to get to the unifying case here, but I think this is an okay point to make. So if you can throw that polling question up, cause my alarm's going off. I think I have it up. Let me see if I can relaunch it here. Maybe that's what needs to be done here. Um, and let's see. Yeah, let me relaunch. There we go. It'll probably work now. Oh, good. It's working. Okay, sweet. They're all geared up, ready. That's rolling in. It's rolling in fast. So. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. We're we're trying. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Experience. I will not keep you. Yeah, not keep no you late. All right. It looks like the uh, the trend is here. There okay. Good. So some of you have heard of the rule of five. So the rule of five essentially states that because of noise being between four to five on any of these yeah. instruments, a change of five microns is indicative of something that's a, a negative prognostic indicator or something that could be a problem here. Well, they've studied it and they've found that on normals, if they use the rule of five with noise, you'd have 25% of people without glaucoma would falsely show that they've actually had progression. So the rule of five, if I do one exam and there's a change of five microns globally for the next exam, using that as a moniker for someone actually having progressed is not the way to go. Okay, so the rule of five is dangerous and something we should not be employing in practice. In essence, when they look at it, uh, you know, in a more comprehensive way, trend analysis is a better way to do it. And so trend analysis, and I'm not sure what's on my next slide, we'll just go on to this. Trend analysis looks like this. And so the rule of five would be an event analysis where we have baselines and we compare each additional exam or event to those baselines. And that would be a change globally of five should rear its ugly head. Uh, or at least you know rule something towards you or make you kind of you know, spark uh, interest. So I guess I'm getting tongue-tied towards the end here. And so if I have a change of five on the event, I should be concerned. Well, you shouldn't. You should repeat it, and you should actually look for trends here. And so the trends are going to show change over time, and they found that that's really the way you want to go. I still think you should put both of these together in making your decision. 
but the trend analysis is what results in you actually having a, a rate of progression that is your target rate of progression. And I'll end on this. It's not statistically or clinically significant unless the average is in excess of the standard deviation. So consider that as well. Uh, I think I'm done at this point. You know, rule number one of CE is you never go over, especially uh, when y'all took the time out of your busy schedules to join us tonight. So I really do appreciate your time uh, and attention. And, and again, my main goal was try to keep my energy up because it's it's tough. It's tough for y'all to listen to two hours of someone talking about OCT. So uh, thanks. Any questions, last minute questions, any comments, Greg or Joe? Or do you want me to move the yep, screen? Go ahead and, uh, just go ahead and stop sharing. I'll share mine. Joe, is there any questions rolling in? Mine's a couple. Uh, let me take a look. Some were just very just uh, good uh, statements people shared. I don't think so. I think we're okay. All right. So let me just show this real quick, just to kind of, I'm not going to go through these cases, but obviously this is a glaucoma case and we're worried about maybe some progression on, on this eye. And, you know, as we go through, what I want to look at is they put these B scans and these different things to look at. And you can see that there's some traction around this T snit. So what I did is I went in and I honed in here and you can just kind of see here that there's traction here, traction here. I'm trying to measure. I'm not sure how my, accurate my measurements are. But I'm just, you know, this traction is going to be different from time to time. And then this was, you know, a case that, you know, same case, but I'm looking at, and this is a, someone will me give an opinion. And if you look right here, you can see the vitreo macular traction, but you come over here, it's it's gone. And then there's this big change right here. So it just go. goes back just to kind of point out that the, the vitreous is alive. You can see it's pulled away here. You have traction here. You can see the segmentation is good. Um, on this, you can see the segmentation lines, but they're going to change. Um, so it can influence. And then this was the opposite. Look at this one here shooting up uh, on this person that, you know, some of my practice is watching in and they're like, what's going on? And you come down here and all of a sudden you got this epiretinal membrane. So remember there's epiretinal membranes, the vitreous is alive. Um, and I think that's just a great way of summing up. Drew, you did a great job of uh, mm -hmm. You know, we took care of the questions. I want to say thank you. This is OCT management of glaucoma. Green isn't always uh, clean, asynchronous virtual course. Thank you very much, Drew. We knew it would be a home run, and uh, you did a great job. All right. Thanks, everybody.